for our closing discussion, uh, we have here on our panel um, Ireland's best known travel commentator, Owen Curry. We have Moira Morell of Kerry County Council, the CEO. We have John McGrillan of Tourism Northern Ireland. We have Jenny Bissols of Falter Ireland and Niall Gibbons of, um, of, of Tourism Ireland. Owen, you know everything about everything. So I'm just going to throw, just to throw the first question to you. We've talked today, um, we've had a theme of sustainability, but we've, we've also talked um, about Great Britain. In a way, they were probably our two big themes today. What do you see as the biggest threat and the biggest opportunity facing Irish tourism today? The bracket with yesterday is sustainability and the what it, not so much sustainability because it's still a difficult thing to project a finger on. Tina just talked about the difficulty of relating it to an individual business until people like Marcus see a dividend uh, coming from the investment and um, we're not going to get the impetus behind it. But what I've been seeing in the last six months, and it relates back to the European election, the Green vote, the um, new von Leyen commission being appointed, um, the document that came out that mentioned tourism once in something like 260 pages, so told me the number of pages because I was blind from reading it. But we will see a movement throughout Europe to implement a green agenda which will not be kind to Ireland. And uh, people who've heard me talk about this before say most of what happens in tourism, marketing is fine, and all of those sort of things, most of it what happens in tourism is about beds and access. And if our access comes under threat, we are facing a bigger difficulty than Brexit, <coughs> and all the smooth music in the background is that access is going to come under threat. So we're talking about all those cheap Ryanair flights being reduced because there's going to be some sort of levy on, <coughs> on, on air flights. Ryanair is the enemy. The aviation industry is the enemy. The aviation industry has been not very coherent in its response. Um, their argument as they're laying it out is, oh, we've got greener aircraft and newer aircraft are less polluting, but they are a small voice in a, as a consensus is developing that aviation is the enemy. Sweden uh, really damaged the uh, inbound tourism to the Canaries. The Canaries is a long flight, as everyone in the room knows, with uh, the first aviation taxes at the beginning of last year. The first hint I got at that was at Victoria Madrid, say, the hotelier saying, our Scandinavian market is very badly hit. We have now the Dutch, the Belgians, uh, moving with aviation taxes. Uh, France is on the cusp of doing the same. Uh, Michael O'Leary, that gets quoted a lot in tourism, we're going to quote him again, he says it's very easy when you can uh, to be a green in the Netherlands where you can cycle everywhere, but when you're on the periphery in Ireland uh, and aviation comes under threat, it's going to affect the livelihood of everyone in this room. So what are you seeing? A return to the use of ferries or are we still into problems with um, <coughs> with, with, with boats anyway? In terms um, we, are, we are going to, uh, okay, the, the big numbers happened in Irish tourism because of low-cost aviation. Mm. Uh, the first minister for tourism I interviewed was probably John Wilson, and he said his dream was two million visitors a year to Ireland. Uh, that's what will come from North America alone, probably next year. So low-cost aviation comes under threat. Everything that keeps us moving comes under threat. The ferries will not be able to, um, you know, the ferries are slightly better off in the environmental debate, but not that much better because LNG hasn't become the staple of ferries and cruise ships since uh, yet. Um, sail to Ireland, all of those sorts of, they're all our options we should be working and we should be working for the elite tourists. But realistically, there isn't that many options um, to come to Ireland without aviation. And what, when the price of aviation was high, our tourist numbers were low, we are looking at um, we're, we're, we're looking at a hell of a debate because the aviation industry are not, uh, you know, they, they won't back off this, you know, they will, they will argue it heavily and they'll be well funded in their arguments. But I don't see the mood in Brussels with, when Andy Ursula moves in with the new commission, and we don't even have a transport commissioner, by the way, um, that, that the uh, Ravana Plum was to be the transport commissioner, and it could be that the, the role of transport commissioner is downgraded in Brussels 
and that all the major arguments are taking place in a room where transport isn't even being heard, and that is bad for us. So if that sort of very gloomy, what, what do you see then? Are we going to have, you know, Britain has a channel tunnel. Beat our drum. Beat our drum that we are green. I think, uh, I don't know which of the speakers this morning talked about we own green, we invented green, green and clean. Mm. We beat that drum. We beat that drum about our, um, our the, the food we serve uh, has the short supply chain. We can actually see um, yeah, but they still have to get here. I mean, what are we saying? Burn up loads of air miles in order to get here and eat green food. It's going to cost them more to get here. That's a reality. I don't think, see any way we're going to escape this uh, one-size-fits-all approach that um, people, you know, any, anybody in the green movement is talking about aviation. They say the real price of aviation is not being reflected in the low-cost fares, so we charge more. So what we were going to have to do if the airfares go up, which they are going to, if the taxes start piling on, is beat our drum about how environmentally uh, sound we are as uh, an industry and as a nation. Um, that <coughs> hasn't been to our, we haven't been able, we haven't been incentivized to do that because the actual people, the number of people who uh, chose holidays because of sustainability is very small. It tends to be largely the Scandinavian market. Uh, but if that grows to a certain level, we are now in a position where we are going to, it's going to be a little bit more expensive to get here, but we heavily, heavily market sustainability with every single marketing campaign and the greenness and the Ireland. And, you know, the, uh, New Zealand has had the same uh, tourism slogan for nearly 30 years, 100% pure. Mm. So something like that, and I can say I can say it now a fortune penny for his next uh, slogan. Uh, something like we invented green. You know, Ireland we invented green. It's better than jump into Ireland or see your heart in Ireland. <laughs> okay, now what what are we going to do? Well, what are we going to do about what is the question? I mean, if you go back to the question you asked, in in the short term, the debate crisis we face is Brexit in the short term because you have another Brexit day coming up on the thirty first of January. We've carried out five waves of a search around the world uh, in Britain, France, Germany, the United States, monitoring consumers' motivations and intentions arising from it. We don't have any issues in the United States. We do have now between 15 and 20% of our customers in Great Britain and in France and in Germany saying they will consider postponing their holiday or spending less or going somewhere else rather than Ireland. That's, can I, that's, can I that's bring you back to Brexit in a minute? Sure. I just wanted to follow on because um, we've had from Owen such a very strong uh, picture of what is, is going to happen if you know levies come on, the cost of flights and access becomes much more expensive. And his answer to it is we label ourselves as the island of invented green. What do you think? Well, we do that around St. Patrick's Day already. We have a very good, solid, consistent reputation abroad already in the space. And I don't think there's anything radical that we need to do in relation to our marketing. We had this conversation actually at our board meeting last month. I mean, Ryanair is using the term that, you know, low emissions airlines, you know. So, it, 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 you know, <laughs> is that believable? <laughs> but, well, so I think what we have to do is send out a message there that's credible, that's very believable. I think the Free Your Heart of Ireland campaign is actually adopted sustainability guidelines last year you know we don't for example promote Dubliners big big um, uh, attractions like this and more already full are not featured in it so we're featured lesser known destinations like Sleeve League getting off the beaten track hidden gems it's featuring more of the northern part of the island of Ireland than the southern one because that's extremely busy the northern part of the wild Atlantic way rather than the southern part this year we'll come around with we'll a bit of Ireland's HDBs to the Ireland City Heartlands so already within the marketing campaigns where we're adapted to the sort of sustainability agenda, the green agenda. Um, but I think the issue of airlines is a critical one. 85% of people who come here come by air. And access is the actual lifeblood of our industry. And we saw the impact of a 10 euro travel tax back in 2009. We lost about 2 million seats. Uh, we, we, we can't afford that. Uh, it was a dramatic impact on our industry. Uh, and it's something that we have to be really careful of. Yeah, because it's not a matter of our not affording it. That's, that would seem to be what's going to happen. But you don't see any need to change the policy direction that we have at the moment in order to uh, accommodate uh, or certainly uh, meet the challenge of increased airfares. Well, I think we have, a, we've never been more coordinated than we've been on policy. I mean, there's a very clear policy statement after 2025 ourselves for uh, the department, <laughs> working with our colleagues in Northern Ireland as well. And um, I, I think the sustainability agenda is, is right at the forefront of it. 
But you know, if 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 at a European level there's going to be increased airfares, we're going to see reduced business. Right, John, you're on the other side of this mirror, on the other side of the border. Well, I mean, I think we already have it. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we, I think we face even greater challenges in Northern Ireland, but and the fact that we do have APD and it has not been abolished. APD. APD is the air passenger duty. It's air passenger duty tax for yeah. you know landing on taking off from from airports in, in, in the UK. So we live with that, and we see the fact that we've seen much greater connectivity developed in Dublin than we have in Belfast as a result of the fact that that tax exists. I, I think one of the things that we're collectively looking at the organisations in terms of our objectives is our targets are not based around numbers. <coughs> our targets are based around visitor spend. And I think you made the point earlier about you know, we seem to be squeezing you know, every penny that we can out of the tourist. But I don't think that's exactly what we're trying to do. I think what we're trying to do is create value. Sorry, Jim. I was wondering where your mic was. Sorry. And um, it may just be peaking. What we are collecting, yeah. seeking to do, is to develop experiences that people see as value for money and that they are prepared to pay more for. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if we can increase spend by giving people a much better experience that they see as value for money, then that means we don't need to bring as many people over the island of Ireland or bring as many people to some of these over visited um, facilities that we've got, then I think we are contributing towards that sustainability agenda but driving economic uh, well being at the same time. Jenny, just to bring you in here then, you know, as Owen was saying, the sort of thing we sell is, you know, the green island, um, but also the green delicious island and the organically grown food. So the, the sort of organic, healthy nature of that food has become even more important. Absolutely. And uh, like Ireland has a great, as Mara was saying, it's like when people talk about Ireland, they talk about it being green. Yeah. You know, so it is the green island. And there's a lot of assumptions that come with that. And I think it is important for us in the tourism industry to make sure that we actually deliver that promise. So, you know, the, we talked a little bit earlier, Tina was saying, if there is an expectation that we are green and that we are sustainable. And, you know, some of the things that we're talking about today, so, you know, going to single, getting rid of single use plastic, you know, that's nearly yesterday's news because actually that's expected now. And if you look at a certain generation, they don't tolerate single use plastic. Uh, and so, you know, we've got to move quicker, I think, in terms of that. Um, you know, we're seeing in our business tourism, actually there are a number of conferences that are coming that actually want to have a positive carbon contribution. And so they talk about, you know, they, they've done calculations about how much carbon it takes to get here. So they're expecting their experiences to be carbon neutral, and then they're expecting to have activities that they can participate in that will actually be carbon positive, like planting a tree or different things. And we're, we're working with industry to try and define, to define some of those things. So I just think there's a, there is a need for a bit of innovation in here, and I think a bit of creativity. Uh, and I, I do think there is a bit of us really needing to maybe up the pace in some of the basic stuff that we're doing, but also, like Owen said, actually shouting about it. Because it is re- it's expected now, so it's really important in all of the experiences that we're doing that we really talk about that. And food has a real opportunity to do it with the organic message, with the, the short food chain. You know, like the examples we gave this morning about going out and actually, you know, picking your hens for uh, your eggs for breakfast from the hens, you know, going out and, and catch a fish and cook a fish, all that stuff really feeds in that message, that sustainable message, which is very important. It's so funny to hear you say that, you know, because as a kid, my mother had hens. And that's what you did in the morning. Yeah. Was, was you would fight to be allowed to, yeah. you know, get the lovely warm egg and and and, and bring it in. And um, Maura, th- I've become conscious over the last few years of the extent to which, when it comes to things, you know, like the environment and sustainability, the planners, the local planning authorities, are absolutely crucial. And um, and in terms. You know what they do usually take their responsibilities very seriously, and um, so when, for instance, there is a proposal for you know maybe some tourism development, but it is seen in some way to go against European rules or the Natura 2000 habitat or whatever, and um, that, that 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 planners will be very conscious of that. So I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent are the planners in your county council? independent i mean will there come points where you would say listen guys this has a really important economic benefit 
for a community that's in danger of dying out totally down on the Ivraha Peninsula or, or whatever it is. So we're choosing between allowing a viable community to remain in that area or uh, obeying the European rules on you know, whatever it is, biodiversity or whatever. So to what extent are the planners simply there doing their job? To what extent are they informed about the economic, the economic consequences sometimes of maybe the decisions that they, they make? Well, I suppose the planner, you know, can't wake up in the morning or I can't wake up in the morning and say, look, this is something that's hugely important to Kerry, so it's going to happen. Mm. Um, you can wake up in the morning and all of us as, as citizens of this county or country can and feed into the, the county development plan. So any, the, the county development plan, and I don't know is it really one of those things that, that's fully understood, but it really sets out in great detail what it is that you see for the next five years for your county and what kind of development you want to see in the county. So if it is something that's a very significant infrastructure, tourism infrastructure, um, that has environmental cons consequences, well then, the first place you have to go is, is into your county development plan and say it's an objective of Kerry County Council, it's an objective, remember this goes out for for 12 weeks of public consultation, so it's very much a document of the people of the county or, or beyond the, and the, the agencies of the, of the country. And the next layer below that is the local area plan. So each of these documents um, have huge public consultation. They're very much, they're very specific. They, they zone lands. You're very much saying what you want on each piece of land or nothing on each piece of land. Um, and certain, you know, so they become the roadmap for anything you want to do. And to get back, I suppose, to your very specific point then, is, well, then if there is a very important um, um, project for the county, of course, everyone is aware that this is a hugely economic, uh, vibrant, or it's essential for the county. But once you get into the planning, you're in the planning. And when you're in the planning, any planner, any chief, ex uh, chief executive, you have to be absolutely under the codes of the directives. You know, I suppose we've seen in, in recent years the, the environmental um, directives. Um, you know, they're the ones that, that really inform the planning uh, and have to be absolutely on, on the right side of those. But once you enter that, that gateway of planning, mm. you're absolutely in, in the independent zone. Mm. Well, that's not to say that at the time of when you're looking at your strategy for the county and when you're saying this is the type of development we want you know uh, i think every year i come on here i talk about green rate but you know we have a 40 million strategy for, for green rate development the minister talked about it this morning you know that's a strategy for this county right across you see the benefit as the county north north and south but yeah when you get into planning you have to close the door on that and you have to let that process be in so if your planners came out and said listen i'm afraid in terms of the Directives of the, uh, the habitat directive of Natura 2000, and um, this is simply not sustainable. Then that's it. Well, I suppose you, there's always uh, ways of. Um, you, you see, once you understand the rules, you can work within the rules. So, and I firmly believe that I've rarely, rarely seen an instance where we have this view that although oh, the the European. Um, because you're in an SSC, you can't do something, or because those rules are, are so stringent, you can't do something. Really, in reality, when you understand the rules, there are ways to mitigate against the, those things which inhibit it, the, the development. Mm. Sometimes they're not, in a very, yeah. very small number. Yeah. But certainly, it would be my experience that in most cases, there are ways in which you can, having that, you have to do the right thing, you have to do it properly, but there are ways of mitigating it against, once you know what the, the problems are, there's ways of properly and rightly working around it. Yes, yeah, just more and more as I get older, I realise that the, the buck stops really with, with the planet. <laughs> and in terms of people who are concerned about the environment and concerned about sustainability, we really do depend on the planners doing their job, on board Canola doing their job, they're the ones. And you know, you can talk about poor old Antashka that doesn't have any money actually to fight the corners it needs to fight. <coughs> but actually those that layer of planners is absolutely vital in terms of defending the sustainability of the wild places. Well, they're the people who have to be yeah. independent 
They have to be your absolute advisors. They have to give you that independent advice. And also remember in any planning, in any planning, be it a local authority planning or a private planning, there is the public consultation. Yeah. And, and public input, you know, certainly does as it should influence and yes, everything. That is that. Okay. Well, can we move on to talk a bit about Brexit, John, if you don't mind talking about Brexit? Brexit. <laughs> Now, what, yeah, if it does go ahead on the basis of what Boris Johnson is now talking about, in terms of your situation in Northern Ireland, how is it going to affect you? I have to say, I, when I came in here this morning, I was sort of, I sat with envy whilst I listened to your minister quite, you know, talk about what he's done and you know, how he's trying to defend the position of the industry and support what the industry is trying to do. We've been sitting in Northern Ireland for the last thousand plus days without a minister. We have a £40 million Brexit, no deal Brexit fund for the whole of Northern Ireland. We're down here, there's a £40 million fund for the tourism industry alone. Um, now and I fight for resources from the government in the north to do the work that we do. I think we've got £360,000 so far in terms of trying to deal with Brexit. We've moved along in comparison to what the 9 or 10 million euros that have been given to the industry here. We're dealing with a 20% VAT rate with a 13.5% VAT rate here. And whilst I know people here might think this is not good, you want to be in our shoes because it is much, much, much more challenging. I suppose Brexit for us has been a little bit of a, up to now, a, a double-edged sword in that, you know, the, the reduction in the value of sterling uh, at the time of the, the referendum. I've seen visitor numbers and visitor spend from the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland increase by about 70% over that period of time. But I think it's time we how, how much the percentage, sorry? 70. 70. 70. Gosh. So it's had a very significant impact in terms of visitor numbers. Now saying that, I mean I think like if the total if one looks at the spend by the Republic of Ireland residents taken on the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland only accounts for about five percent of that total spend. So I think we need to get it into context of what seven percent looks like in real terms? It's it's not you know it's not huge, but it is not it's not insignificant. But what I would say is over the period of time, I think the impact of Brexit has started to the negative impact of Brexit <coughs> has started to materialise, and um, that some of that's indirect. I would suggest that you know, the fact that we you know as we were leading up to the um, the Brexit date, the thirty first October, I think we've seen a significant downturn in consumer confidence in GB in the domestic market in the market here. I think we've seen that start to you know to, to make its way through. I think that we've continually been talking about the, the Irish border or the Northern Ireland border um, and we are stuck in the midst of debate which has got a negative context to it and has had for a significant period of time hasn't been helpful. I would suggest that the political discourse between our politicians north and south hasn't done any of us any favours either um, but I, I think where we need to get to is we need a decision mm -hmm. uh, well you know, whatever that happens to be and take some of the uncertainty away and I know you know the comment was made earlier and I think it's absolutely right you know we are at the start of the process but at least if we know what that process looks like mm -hmm. and that uncertainty starts to disappear and things seem to calm down and we start to talk about other things other than Brexit and the other factors of impact on our lives I think then you know, we will start to see, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, a return to, you know, a more a more positive environment. But, um, it, it is certainly something that we find quite challenging without saying in, in the short, and expect that to continue into, you know, sort of into next year. I think this year we've been comfort. Uh, we uh, the impact has been softened slightly because of the fact that we hosted the Open Championship mm. over the summer, um, and I think we'll end up. In a positive position at the year end, but certainly the second half of the year will be much softer than the first. Well, something raised by Simon Calder, and I'm going to put it both to yourself and to Mary Gibbons. Um, he was sort of saying that um, the free travel area between Britain and Ireland, which will allow ordinary Britons to travel without any problems in terms of visas or passports yeah. or whatever, could actually turn out to be uh, a, an important source of revenue, both north and south. What do you think? Well, I agree with that. I mean, the yeah. UK market is a critical market for all of us. Uh, so, 
the fact that you've got that ease of, ease of travel, I think, is very important. Um, I think what we need to get away from is actually discussions around the border and discussions about the impact of what a border might have. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, that, that's been negative. Um, so again, having some certainty and being clear of the fact that a border will not exist and that free travel are exists. And getting those messages out, I think, in the UK market is going to be really, really important for all of us. No, that comment about the free travel area. Yeah, it's it's a uh, two sides to the coin. Uh, he's right in one sense. Uh, I mean, having the common travel area and having that reassured is very good for us. And people who are knowledgeable about the travel trade know about it. So we have actually seen some anecdotal evidence of, for example, coach tours now diverting some business into Ireland because of the prospect of perhaps big queues down the M20 getting into Dover Calais, which was just a catastrophe waiting to happen, by the way, um, according to our UK sources. Uh, makes it easier to come to Ireland. <coughs> However, for the average consumer who is just booking a flight on Ryanair or Lingus, um, we, we find through our research that the knowledge of the common travel area isn't really there. They still think that they probably need a passport. But what you do for Ryanair, you need a driver's license for Lingus. There are different rules and regulations. There doesn't seem to be an appetite to make it as easy as possible, so to speak, you know? So I, I think two sides to the coin, so to speak. But the most worrying thing about um, Brexit in the short term, and we've carried out five waves of research because you know, we all have our own views of this, but how's our customer feeling? Uh, our customer is feeling more nervous as we approach the Brexit day. So the 29th of March, the 12th of April, the end of October. For example, the October one is coming right in the middle of mid-term. So if you are a household in Britain and you're going to go away with your family, being in the European Union at the beginning and possibly not at the end, that's going to impact on your decision because you don't want to pass it. So we're seeing that creep into mainland Europe now, into France and into Germany. And what our customers are saying to us is that I'm not too sure what the situation is in Ireland. I know there's a border. I don't know if I'm going to need a passport or a license, and I might just end up postponing my trip for another year because I just don't need a hassle. You know, don't get don't, don't trouble. It's not that. But between 13 and 16 percent of French and Germans are saying that to us at the moment, and that's a significant proportion of people. And we have a small number of people who are contracting our contract centre as well, raising these issues. And they're the people that are taking the trouble to write. You know, so there's a lot of other people that probably aren't. So we're, we're pleased, I mean, in fairness, I have to say here, the government have listened to us. We have got money, uh, an additional six million euros to spend overseas on reassurance messages, which are, which are going out there right now, uh, and also kickstart campaigns at the end of the year for 2020. What are the reassurance messages going to say? Never been easier to get here. The cost of getting here is actually probably cheaper than it's been 30 years ago, we won't say it like that. But fill your heart with Ireland. You know, it's about getting um, your, your share of voice up in the international markets. In Great Britain, North America, France and Germany, which is 70% of our customers and the markets most vulnerable to us, so to speak. But particularly within Great Britain, which is on our doorstep, and just reassuring them that it's business as usual. Ireland is open, it's fun, it's a place you can switch off, spend time with your family and loved ones, and they're the type of things that motivate those customers. So, I mean, the, we used to have quite a golden time in terms of, of British visitors. I remember my aunt, Greg Nemana, used to run a bed and breakfast and people used to come to fish, and she loved the British fishermen. She said they were great, they'd help you to wash up, they'd get up from under your feet all day, um, and they didn't roll in drunk at 11 o'clock <laughs> like the Germans and the Dutch did. Um, but I do remember that somewhere like Greg Man, it was full of English fishermen, um, and they liked it here, they liked the drink, they liked the fact that our ways were similar to theirs. Um, I mean, do you, do, you, do you see this actually meaning an increase in the declining market that there has been in British tourism? Yeah, I think we actually still have a golden age of tourism in Britain. Sometimes we beat ourselves up. I mean, the record year was back around 2007, where mm -hmm. it touched 5 million visitors. Uh, this year will probably be within the top five of all best years. I mean, the profile of the British customer has definitely changed. I mean, anglers have aged, yes. and they're the new type of person that's coming in. We have a lot of flexibility in terms of your ease of 93 percent are just booking online it's so easy to get here from britain and there are 230,000 seats on sale every single week there are 40,000 spaces on our car ferries every week i mean i think one of the the, the most enduring successes that irish tourism has had is in 21 years of the good friday agreement when myself and john working together selling the island of ireland we've seen an amazing renaissance in northern ireland so so there's an awful lot more choice for customers now and i think we will see when the, when the brexit is sorted out in whatever shape or form it comes, I think you will see another renaissance of British figures coming. But we will have to work hard in that relationship because I think while technology has been great for tourism over the last 20 years, we have seen you know unhelpful conversations across social media which start off with good intentions, but we read the thread of some conversations as some terrible rift vitriolic stuff going on out there. And I think we have to re-engage in a positive conversation with Britain as soon as this, this present conversation is over.
how do we have that conversation now in BP? Um, it's again a lot of marketing, a lot of. Uh, I don't really know, uh, for instance, how strong our uh, back to the sustainability the point I made. How strong, how sustainable, how good our industry is on sustainability. But I know there are people who are not as good making a loud noise about it. We should be. We can pick. We pick up. Every single strand, every single positive, and Niall has this immense research and all the positive things about Ireland that the British have, and you shout loud about it. People in the room will remember the emergence of organic food movements and farmers direct, delivering directly to the customer many years ago. It was hijacked by the big money interests because they put a picture of farmer Tino Dwyer or a farmer Paula Panila up on their, their supermarket and yeah. gave the impression this person with the lettuce is supplying a chain of 120 shops. A lot of, of what happens in tourism, and tourism by its nature is selling dreams, is picking a couple of positive thoughts, and maybe they're entirely true, maybe they're not true, and flushing every single available channel with them. And all the positivity that we've enjoyed in Britain, which it would have been inconceivable you know, in, long, in the time when you were working in London, all that positivity is still there, we channel it, we work it. Where I see um, the problems arising will be again back to access. Brexit scared the airlines. Uh, the March uh, deadline, the advance bookings dived. Airlines respond to advance bookings by reducing the fares. You can actually track onlineair.com that they were trying to sell off fares, not just to Ireland, but all over Europe. They have to do the same again with October. When they're caught in a situation where they're selling off cheap seats, they start reducing the number of flights. Mm. And we have to have um, make enough of a splash as we face each wave of Brexit, and it seems to be uh, becoming with new dates being caught up almost on the spur of the moment. We must face each of those by convincing, by doing, uh, con as Niall says, convincing the industry, the industry don't need that, need that much con convincing. The consumer, a little bit harder work, but the big decision makers, the influencers, the gatekeepers, are the people who run the airlines. And they will, if they start turning off our air access from Britain like a tap, that's when it will really impact on us. So I've got a question to all of you, and in a way what you've just last said may, 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 may answer it, and I'll just start with you now and then go around the panel. Um, Listening today to the talk about um, sustainability, the issue did keep coming up of the point at which we have to say, well, it's not just a numbers game. Uh, it has to be a quality game um, as, as well. And now if I can just throw that one at you. Um, you know, does, have we reached the point where the, the push to increase numbers year on year on year now has to give way, perhaps, to being a lot more thoughtful about the quality of the product we're selling, particularly in relation to uh, our own um, environment, the ecological situation in, in our own country. You know, do we have to move back perhaps to a, a more complex and a more thoughtful approach than merely increasing the numbers year on year? I think I've been at this point earlier on. We've never been more joined up on policy in all my time in tourism, 20 years at it. Um, there's a really good policy out to 2025 now that balances that sustainable bit with not the push for numbers anymore. We don't talk about the number of people who come, 7.2 million to the island, by the way, but it's actually looking for people who stay longer, and spend more, and look for a quality experience. That is what it's all about. But now, whenever you hear the tourism reports from Fort Ireland or whatever on the radio, the first headline is, tourist numbers increased last year, more people from here, more people from there. That's basically how it's sold. Well, that's part of the story, and perhaps it's sometimes actually hard to get this tourism story across in the media here, to be honest with you. Sometimes the only thing that people want to talk about. Uh, I know in all, in all my years, in 10 years... I've seen the press releases, Niall, and the, the numbers press are the headlines. They, they cover them when the numbers are down. Quite often, they don't cover them at all, and they're going up, ironically. But look, I, I think... The term and term is what we do. I think, the, I think the balance on policy is actually quite reasonable at the moment. I think when we talk about sustainability, the question is, we're going to ask in 2025, if we this policy, is what did we actually do? Um, there's a lot of talk goes on, but what will we actually have achieved and what are, what are the targets that are there for sustainability? I think that conversation will have to go <coughs> hand in hand with the, the numbers bit. But the numbers bit is more about the spend and the jobs than about the actual numbers of people that come. And remember, when we talk about increasing by, you know, whatever, 3 or 4% next year, 
our clock goes back to zero on the 1st of January. The people that came here this year aren't coming next year and they have to be out there fishing in the pool again and there's no certainty in relation to those Jenny, from your point of view, is it, do we have to get back from a mere numbers game and start to look both at the quality of the experience for us as well as the incoming tourists? Yeah, it's like Mary said, and I think the policy is drawing up, but that's exactly what our strategy is. So if you look at the strategy from Fort Ireland in terms of developing the product, it is about sustainability, but we're kind of doing it through two different ways, it's about regionality and seasonality. So what we're looking to do is spread the visitors more around the country. So actually we're looking to actually move them from those hot spots to the cooler spots. And we're also looking to get the visitors at a different time of the year. So, you know, actually extending the season so that they're not all coming in, in June, July and August. So I think that, you know, seasonality and regionality will really help us drive that sustainability piece. But I think back to all that we've been talking about today is at a product level, we need to ensure that we're really developing sustainable products and that we're delivering quality experiences that meet the needs of our visitors. And we have to be aware that those needs are changing and they're getting more and more demanding on that sustainability. Okay. Owen, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, numbers versus quality, but is the whole access situation going to wipe out the numbers anyway? Well, if that's, that's the, the, what the mood music as I'm reading it. Um, I, what you're, I'm answering now is a slightly different question. Should we be out of the numbers business? Absolutely not. Um, they, I, the country that resembles us closest in size in Europe is Austria. It has, 30, it has 20 million uh, visitors a year, we have something like 11 and a half. We could be in the numbers business. We can be bringing more numbers in. We have to work harder for them because of the things I said earlier. Uh, I don't think that a million people coming to the tips uh, is a problem, whereas 300,000 was not. I think that um, those million will stay somewhere else. They will bring more money into the economy than employ people. Tourism as an industry is too big and too important to us to start switching it off or putting closing the gate and saying no more people in. We can, um, we can manage far more visitors and the places that are under threat um, have survived. Newgrange was instance earlier. If we continued what we were doing in Newgrange up to 1994, uh, the place would have been destroyed. It's a hugely successful tourist attraction and well managed. Mm -hmm. It's don't confuse management of your of uh, increased numbers with the fact that there are too many. We can have 20 million people uh, coming to Ireland if the uh, sustainability debate allows us to, which is a separate <coughs> issue, but numbers are good for the our tourism industry. Higher spend is good as well, but numbers are not bad. Um, Moira, the yeah. whole question of, of, of numbers versus quality. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, we talk about hotspots, but you know, one could say Kerry's hotspot, but yet, you know, we have huge capacity, we, you know, we have huge capacity in the county mm -hmm. when you take it year on year. And that's certainly something with Fort Ireland, and if we do recent development plans or gateway here for Clarence, that it is more thoughtful and a lot more thoughtful because we know we have vacancy in our accommodation for a huge volume of the year. And really it is about how are we getting um, the visitor to stay longer. If you take on the Dingle Visitor Development Plan, it's about developing experiences like we talked about, even food and things like that today, right along the peninsula. And, and you know, keeping people in the area and moving it out. If you take the Killarney Gateway plan here, there are things again such as the food, local craft, you know, again about enhancing the experience of people who come here because I suppose it's getting back to what Mary said earlier, it's about people staying longer mm -hmm. uh, and spending the time and that they're not just coming in fr from Dublin doing their day trip, covering all, the, all what would be seen as the hotspots and say that garbage and back to Dublin. So, you know, so certainly, and I would agree totally, the whole management has become very much part of the, the tourism thinking locally than perhaps it would have been here before. John, numbers has there been too much emphasis on the numbers game, or is it simply <coughs> that we have to have better and more sophisticated management of uh, of tourists as they come in? Well, I, I, I think ultimately it's a bit stripping it back as to why do we have a tourism industry in the first instance and why do we invest in it? Um, and it's really about using the visitor to help drive economic benefit, sustain rural communities, sustain urban communities, and create jobs, create employment, and give everybody a better standard of life. And I think if we look at it in that context, 
it's a matter of taking it from there and looking to see how do we how do we make the best of what we've got. And I mean, I don't disagree with them. I I think there is plenty of room for more people on the island of Ireland, and it is about, as Jenny said, developing sustainable products and experiences across the whole island. So that means that people will be spread around, and that all you know all parts of society and communities benefit from that. We've just launched a new brand of our travel market this week and it was very much focused on that. It was about sustainable tourism experiences that are outside of Belfast, outside of the you know, places with big football like the Giants Causeway, where people have probably never heard of before, but will get really, you know, tremendous experiences that are really fulfilling and leaving them going home thinking it was really worth my while going to the island of Ireland and that's the place that I would want uh, want to go back to. And I think there was a point, a very useful point made earlier that you know, in all of this debate, tourism can often be seen to be, you know, the bad guy. Tourism could be the, you know, the, a real contributor to the sustainability of those local communities. You know, providing income that allows us to manage our landscapes, and you know, support and maintain those fantastic heritage assets that were spoken about earlier. So we have got a very important role to play in society in general, and, and making sure that we provide everybody with a better standard of living. Okay, it's a good note to end on. Thank you, John. Thank you to our panel. And I would like to hand over now to Margaret Cahill, who is the chair of the organising committee of Let's Talk Tourism and International. Thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, staying with us for the entire day. We started off this morning saying that sustainability was the foundation for the future. And I think uh, having had the wide ranging discussion all day that you would agree that it is the most important issue facing us for the future. We do hope that you have taken something from the discussions today and that where you see where practice or policy needs to change, that you can influence this in your own business or your own life. I quickly want to say a few thank yous uh, to our sponsors. We could not hold this conference without AIB and uh, Kerry County Council. Maura, thank you for your support and your encouragement. All of the people in A AIB, particularly to David McCarthy, you're wonderful to work with, and Sarah for your uh, enlightening presentation. To the Kerry branch of the Irish Hotels Federation, led by uh, Bernadette Randalls, the chairperson, thank you for the support and all of the meetings. Paul Cherry and the members of the Killarney uh, Chamber of Tourism and Commerce, Fall to Ireland to uh, Jenny and all of your colleagues, thank you for the suggestions and financial help as well, thank you. Uh, and to my friend here from Tourism Ireland, to Niall Gibbons, who is always at the end of the phone, but makes great suggestions and <coughs> with his colleagues has been a great help as well. Scala International, um, the largest global uh, travel organization in the world. Um, we would welcome you to be members. To the Great Southern, thank you, uh, Etienne, Denise, and uh, Ipto Scali is still around. It's a fantastic hotel. Thank you to the students from IT in Tralee. We had Ali, Dawn, Keith, and Valentine. Nice to see these young people so interested in uh, Irish tourism and wanting to be part of it. If I can recognize the members of the organizing committee, I'm not so sure how many are here. Uh, Emer Corrigan from the Caranan, Conor Hennigan, who is not here from Hennigan uh, Consulting, Eve O'Shea from the Killarney Park, Bernadette Randalls, Michael Rosney from Killeen House Hotel. And finally, Kira O'Grady, if everybody has met Kira, they've probably been speaking to us. Kira is our project manager, and I, each year I'm amazed with her capacity for work and getting things done. And you might be interested to know that in her job, new day job, she's recently been appointed as Director of Arts, Innovation and Corporate Services 
at the Glen Eagle Group. So congratulations to Kira. And finally, a sincere thank you to all our speakers. We could not hold this uh, conference without your support. And as I told you last night, you are the stars. Finally, a date for your diary. <coughs> uh, the 6th of November, 2020. We look forward to seeing you back here in Killarney next year. Thank you very much and safe home, everyone. Thank you.